Thank you very much everyone for joining our webinar today, focusing on the importance of evidence uh, for development. Now, I'm, I'm, my name is Stephen Weiber. I am Director of Policy and Advocacy at IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations. I just want to give a little bit of context as we start this session. Crucially, I think the message I want to give is that development depends on decisions. The choices we make about how we live, how we eat, how we work, how we travel, how we communicate, how we use resources and more are determining for sustainability. The SDGs are based to such a great extent on changing behaviours, on people doing something different, doing something new compared to the status quo. We know very well we can't stand still, we need to accelerate, we need to do more. Clearly, a key factor in decisions is motivation. The decisions needed for sustainable development are not always easy ones. They require us to be far-sighted, sometimes to privilege the interests of the future over the interests of today. They require changes in attitudes and preferences, and even to face short-term unpopularity in the case of decision makers. But in order for a decision, a choice, to exist in the first place, there needs to be information. We need to be able to judge what the right thing to do is before we can even work out if we have the motivation to do it. This is a common issue. It's shared between individuals, between communities, between local governments, between national governments, all the way up to intergovernmental organizations. While it's all too often taken for granted, we do all need access to information, to knowledge, in order to be able to live better, more sustainable lives. The costs of the absence of this access are clear. Decisions are made on the basis of limited information. They're little more than guesswork or at worst superstition. Opportunities to do better are missed. Urgent, challenge, ch uh, urgent changes are delayed, meaning that more drastic steps become necessary later. Fundamental rights are left unrealized. The potential of democracy to deliver responsive government is undermined. And yet there is too rarely an effort to look at how we can holistically build a society where everyone has the access to information they need to take the right decisions for development. So this is what we're going to explore in more depth in today's session with perspectives and very different types of library, but all which all have the common goal of delivering access to information in order to improve lives and accelerate the achievement of the sustainable development goals. They will shed light on the different dimensions of this access and the importance of investing in how we provide it in order to make sure that everyone has the awareness, the confidence and the skills to make the most of it. I'm therefore extremely welcome to, well, happy to welcome our panellists here today. First of all, we will have Sigrun Haberman, who is the Head of Library Services at the United Nations Library Services at the United Nations Office in Geneva, a post she's held since 2019. She's been at the library since 2006, working on strategic planning, program evaluation and outreach, and before that as a records manager and archivist. Then we will have, uh, so I'm going to go to my list, uh, then we will have Emma Farrow. Emma is an independent consultant based in Finland and a chartered librarian with extensive experience in the academic and international development sectors. She's also an experienced and enthusiastic trainer. She previously worked as a knowledge and evidence specialist for Public Health England and previously held posts at Bath Spa University and INAS. Magda Gomulka, has been, uh, is, it works as a training coordinator at the Sil at Silesian Libraries. She's also an active volunteer in the new professional special interest group of IFLA, my organization. She's also engaged in various international processes, including the Internet Governance Forum last year in Katowice and the World Urban Forum. Finally, Greta Cavalletiediene is chairperson of the Young Librarian section of the Lithuanian Librarians Association as well as head of the Cultural Heritage Research and Digitization Department, the Panavezis County Gabriele Petiv Petkovicaite Vitel Public Library. She is a historian, professional guide, volunteer and a Rotary Club member. So what we're going to do in this session is um, each of our speakers is going to give a short talk, so seven or eight minutes, about their perspective on one of the elements, one of the factors of how we can make sure that everyone benefits from the evidence for development, the evidence they need to take decisions at different levels in different ways. And then after that, we'll have a panel discussion where each of our panelists will respond to the same questions and hopefully we'll get a bit of discussion going. 
there should also be time at the end for questions and answers. And so, as said, I do encourage you to use the I do encourage you to use the questions and answers function. So, with that, I'd like to hand over to Sigrun to go first. Sigrun, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, very glad that you've invited me to participate in this panel discussion, particularly as it is at the uh, UNECE uh, Regional Forum. Uh, at the United Nations Library in Geneva, we also have a lot of clients from UNEC. We're not the official UNEC library, but we work a lot with them. So I'm very glad to be able to share some information there as well. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen and my little PowerPoint there. Can you see it? Is everything fine? No, not coming yet? Not yet. <laughs> that looks better. That that is better. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't see it yet, but hold on. It's showing up to us. It's showing up for you guys. Okay, so that's great. Voila. So um, this uh, panel discussion, voila, is on how evidence enables development and what we do in our libraries to support it. So. The bit that I'm talking about from the United Nations perspective in Geneva is about the knowledge and learning commons, actually, which we've turned into a space for meaningful progress for the SDGs, but for our, also for other uh, UN agendas. So um, you can imagine that we at the United Nations obviously are at center of the discussions on and around the SDGs. The clients that we serve, like I mentioned before, UNECE staff, for example, are there are part of the policy creating processes, the governmental, but also the intergovernmental processes that are happening here uh, in Geneva and then in New York and in other places. So our own library and archives director, he had actually been directly involved in the SDG training processes for member states before he joined our institutions, so we're very much connected there. Our clients are also part of the SDG observers, the SDG reviewers, and then of course the implementers themselves, because they are representatives from non-governmental organizations, their UN staff, but also staff of other international organizations. And some of them are on a political level, but many of them also on a technical level. So they're really into the details of the SDGs. They're into the measurements, for example, as well, but they're also into the campaigning and into the networking. So my presentation today is really about this vehicle that I mentioned before. It's a means that we developed in order to make meaningful progress on some of the SDG objectives here within our organization, with the staff of the United Nations Geneva, and particularly with the member states, who are also uh, key uh, primary clients actually of our library as well. They are the staff mainly of the permanent missions to the United Nations that are located here in Geneva. So. Uh, sorry about my. Uh, so, to better understand our context, there's just a little slide with some visuals on the core functions that we deliver on because basically the Commons really benefited from all of that together. So, we deliver traditional library services, and you see one of the reading rooms there as well. So, we're a hybrid library with a mainly online presence, obviously, a virtual service desk. We're working hard on providing access to digital information sources. We also have a great physical space with several large reading rooms for research and learning. We still purchase print when it's useful. And we preserve a historical collection that dates back to the League of Nations. So the League of Nations was the predecessor to the United Nations. And that's when our library was actually founded in 1919. And we also have a small but important collection of books about peace from the 16th century onward. So that's really the focus in our historical collection. Then, as library and archives, because this is what our institution is called, we have an institutional memory section. They deliver on archives and records management. Uh, that service just finalized the digitization. It's a really a major European project, actually. They digitized and then online published and digitally preserved more than 14 million pages of the entire League of Nations archives. So that's... Uh, well, uh, that's the League of Nations, like I said, was a predecessor organization to the UN. It was really the first experiment of an intergovernmental political organization um, on the international level. So that's a, a major achievement. Those are obviously learnings that we put into our uh, into the way that we deal with our clients as well. And then we deliver for cultural diplomacy. So you can see some, a slide there on. That's actually a UNECE exhibition that there was because international organizations and member states, they come and 
present their culture at the Palais des Nations, which is our home. And uh, this one was on uh, ecological fashion, eco-fashion back then. And it was really a, a great event back then with the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. So we, what we do is we manage that program of cultural events at the Palais. In the heydays, right before COVID, we had up to 100 events a year, in addition to what all we're doing at the library, right? And uh, we organize the logistics for it. And we hold these events really together with the member states. We represent the director general there very often. And so our final function is that of a knowledge and learning commons which was, as we considered, really a natural evolution of a library. It was based on the other three functions. And it allowed us to bring together the knowledge, but also the networks and the skills that we acquired in these other functions. And really all for the purpose of improving, improving the work of the organization, which is really working on Agenda 2030 directly, right? So we're square in that. All right, next slide. So this slide shows you what kind of assets we have, which are at the heart of the SDG debate as well. So I want to start with information because I think most of us as librarians, we know that information is really, is really what we're all about, what we're dealing with. So we do have the resources, the uh, digital resources, the print resources. We have the information management expertise. And as library at the United Nations here, we're really a, an institution that is trusted. That's one of the things that we developed over the last years, particularly. We trusted for being impartial. I guess that comes with all of the libraries. Most of the libraries are considered to be impartial partners, right? For providing information, evidence that is factual and vetted, for delivering services quickly and on time also, and uh, for constantly improving and seeking ways to better ways to deliver. So that is really, I think, a major part of trust is something that we need to establish with our stakeholders is that we are always seeking to improve ourselves because the world is changing rapidly, you know, especially through technology. And we need to be going with that to be able to be, still be trusted in a few years. Right. Then the people on the other side, many of our librarians who come with a subject expertise, often in international relations, but also in law and economics, the big fields that the UN is working in. In addition to that, in our work, we bring in subject experts that work with us on some of the projects. So another important aspect of the people that work at the United Nations is not just in our libraries, that we all subscribe to the same values. Values are really key at the United Nations. Diversity being one of the most important ones, and I will remember I will come up with this word several times because really that's that's a key factor and it's also in our approach to the SDGs a key factor as well. So it's a diversity, it's the impartiality that I mentioned before, and it's our new behaviors framework. We have inclusion, integrity, humility, and humanity as four uh, values or behaviors that really go together when we want to achieve uh, improvements for uh, the lives of, of the people in this world. So uh, this is also why I call it, it's uh, actually a call to action as well on, an, on a very individual level that we very much feel also as, as librarians here at the, at the United Nations. Another major asset that we have are our networks. Already being part of the networks of the United Nations obviously is crucial. We connect to different, other different UN entities. And you could see that, for example, in the... Uh, even in the cultural activities, it's not on an information level or a recorded information level, but it's a very, it's a kind of a complementary level. It's where you gather information about other countries in a very different way, in an artistic way, right? And it, but it also creates knowledge and it, ex, it lets you exchange and, and appreciate diversity and different points of views. Then uh, it's, of course, other funds and programs and the libraries that are within that whole circle of the United Nations system. And then we connect to networks of other international organizations, of course, like the European Union, who has a liaison office here, uh, the African Union, you know, other international organizations like that, non-governmental organizations who are observers at the, the, to the processes of the United Nations as well, private companies as well, because they come in through the global compact as well. And then particularly academia. And there are many, many schools and uh, 
faculties that are interested in the work of the United Nations. We particularly work together with some universities in Geneva, of course, but then there are also others that work with us on historical issues. For example, the Danish university is very interested, but then uh, we also had some relationships, for example, with German universities there. And these are really assets that together bring us a great convening power. So I think this is also something that in general works for many libraries, for most libraries, is that we do have great convening power and we need to use this for the betterment of the world or for achieving our goals, which in that sense would be the SDGs. And then as a fourth asset, we have the spaces. I already said we have some impressive spaces. I didn't, didn't bring more pictures of that, but I mean, Stephen knows when you come in, it's all about, it was all about the Palais des Nations. It was a palace of nations. Uh, it was about peace, peace being something something pure and stately and grand, and our library fits right into with that. So we have these reading rooms that are great, but they're also conducive to informal debate. And that I think is something that is really crucial, is that uh, when you're still on site, because we are all hybrid, right? That you have places that create an ambiance where you want to exchange information. Uh, being in the library, you know that you are close to knowledge, so I'm talking for most of the people that come here, they feel this, there's this feeling that you're close to knowledge, that there's an informed debate is not going all over the place usually, because, uh, you know, knowledge kind of focuses you, right? And then the people that, that exchange, they really very easily slip into this culture of knowledge sharing that we as libraries promote as well. So um, this uh, knowledge and learning commons uh, was really, in the very beginning, based on the simple fact that we own these physical spaces and then we created virtual spaces, as I'll explain as well to that. It's like many commons huh, in libraries. We use our connections to connect people, but also to then enable minds and create knowledge. So we've really gone beyond that. We're, we're actively trying to create knowledge with the people that come there. And that all with the aspiration, obviously, of doing our part in renewing multilateralism. So. For us as United Nations, that is obviously uh, that's obviously important. But renewing multilateralism is also goes all the way through Agenda 2030 uh, in the way that it's being done. It's like we're, we're communicating not just between governments anymore, but with people, with other institutions, interested parties. Uh, they all have a say now. So, so this is really what we're uh, driving towards. Voila, so we started developing and evolving based on this earlier pyramid from 2018 on as a knowledge commons. We did a user needs analysis and it brought us the hand and you can still see that hand over there. So this hand where uh, really we knew that in at the center of everything that the United Nations wants to do is inclusion and diversity. This is, a, this is the value that we cannot forget. And then we identified five streams that our um, clients were really interested in, in communication, innovation, technology, sustainability, obviously. Well at work, though, was an important issue as well. Diplomacy and partnerships. So um, we worked on that, for example, we brought in innovative, innovation is actually also a keyword. We brought in innovative um, ways of working together, interactivity. Uh, already with technology get together, but also using on site, so really being hybrid there as well. And um, then in 2020, so that was not much later, the COVID crisis hit, right? And so I just want to explain real quick on how the commons actually helped build resilience at UN Geneva, and we're really known for that as well. So what we did is we used our convening power and our networks to just simply set up online sessions. And we worked mainly with the people who would do who would help you feel well at work. So it was a series of talks with staff counselors, for example, under our well at work stream. The first um, 10 days, actually 10 days into the confinement, we were already having the first sessions with the staff counselors on how to cope with, with the confinement. We, uh, the topics included, for example, keeping a healthy mind, coping with fear and anxiety, preparing emotionally for the return to the workplace, because actually we opened up in June already, so we weren't confined for very long. But in addition to that, we scheduled mindfulness sessions. And that also in English and French, that was very important. We have the work, working languages here in Geneva, English and French. 
So that was uh, very important. We had mindfulness sessions twice a week or even more often than that. We experienced, you know, experimented a little bit how to do this online uh, because there were not, were not a whole lot of best practices there on doing everything online when everybody, including the yoga teacher, is online only and not in a space, you know. So uh, we did all that. And by the end of October, we had hosted 52 events in 2020 with uh, more than 3,600 participants, actually. And that was more than the whole of 2019. So uh, the team, you know, with uh, obviously, you know, churning out these events as well, they built a very unique experience in organizing virtual events. And it made the Commons a go-to place for such formats. The colleagues had actually developed a center of excellence in online events at UNOG. And this reputation is something that is still standing today. We've actually managed to also show that the libraries, you know, are also at the edge of the this type of technology, because then we purchase the appropriate technology with it. We use some of our budget for that instead of maybe information resources. So that's actually as a library, these sometimes are difficult decisions, but uh, this was definitely worth it. It's something for the future. You invest in your future when you invest in technology. Do, do, I can say, do, do, do close in the next couple of minutes so we can get on yes. to the others. Thank okay. you. So the next, uh, the next challenge now, of course, it's still the same. It's challenge the digital future. And that's still everything that works for the SDGs. So we're now still supporting the SDGs actors and thinkers. Uh, we connect minds and knowledge by meetings, but also by information tools. And you can see here, there are some invitations for digital diplomacy in practice events, for example, but also one of our major tools, the conference primers. Uh, which bring together UN internal knowledge together with external knowledge as well. And uh, my last slide, that's it. So really it's coming all coming back to diversity, inclusion, multilingualism, access and accessibility, which uh, can further us on this motto on leaving no one behind in development. And a crucial, really crucial role for libraries is being a trusted partner by providing trusted information and, and having a trusted a trustworthy relationship that's what it is and and that's how we're hoping to be a library as partner for meaningful progress and continue like that thank you thank you very much there's there's, there's, there's so much in there which i really appreciate i think just that point about the importance of, of maintaining what matters so the importance of trust and making sure that we still I mean, trust in evidence, that people trust in evidence and knowledge in order to take decisions. But I really liked in particular this emphasis on a more proactive approach, uh, an approach to trying to get people to engage more actively to become a space for creating knowledge, because in the end, that's what we're going to need to accelerate the SDGs. Um, the points that you made about this being at the heart of, of, of rejuvenating multilateralism is a really interesting point and clearly this is also what we see in, in our common agenda and some of the pan UN strategies that are focused on this and of course you gave me a really easy way to go to our next speaker by highlighting the work you were doing within the UN family in Geneva on COVID um, so that, that's my segue to move to Emma in order to talk a little bit about the role of information in supporting an effective response to COVID-19 so Emma over to you. You're still muted. <laughs> That's it. Sorry about that. Yes, let me just get my slides up. I'll share my screen. Three years of practice isn't enough, is it? <laughs> <laughs> is that coming through? It's not, is it? Not quite yet. Try that again. Right, give it another go. It seemed to work a second time around. Yeah. That's looking better. Okay, and let's get this up. That's looking good, over to you. Lovely, thank you. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. And yes, I'm, I'm focusing very much on the um, way that my organization responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am the convener for the IFLA Evidence for Global and Disaster Health Special Interest Group. And we work to promote and strengthen the role that librarians play in times of disaster and in response to global health challenges. We were set up in, up in 2018 and I don't think anyone could have anticipated the, um, the COVID crisis that then hit. Um, I'm very much looking at the role of evidence in informing policy. 
um, and I'll be drawing on my own experience as an information specialist working within a public health agency during the pandemic. This screen is really representing how the initial scarcity of papers was very quickly replaced by an unprecedented volume of new information and data around the pandemic. Uh, we quickly realized that the information was being published in um, unconventional ways. So for example, it was appearing within uh, peer reviewed journals, but not as articles, it was appearing as um, letters to the editor, as comments pieces, anything to bypass any delays in making the information available. There was also a huge increase in um, preprints, so papers that were shared before the pre review process. And research, especially the early research, was of varying quality as researchers rushed to share their findings. So where did librarians come in? Well, we brought the expert search and retrieval skills that were needed to identify these diverse key um, sources, as I say, and many of them unconventional, um, and also developing effective strategies. And that was particularly important because there was no standard terminology at the beginning. So here we've got just some of the terms that were being used um, by authors when they were publishing their papers. And this reoccurred at various stages during the pandemic, for example, as the, the um, variants were emerging. Um, so again, just adding to the challenge of finding the evidence. So within this complex and rapidly changing evidence environment, a knowledge of research methods and um, particularly secondary research methods were crucial. And there were also strong judgment skills needed to balance between the need for an in-depth search but rapidly finding results. So the funnel here is to represent that it wasn't just about finding the evidence, but then screening and evaluating it. As I say, particularly at the beginning, it was a variable quality. Um, understandably, studies that were done, for example, would have had smaller numbers of participants. Um, and what we wanted to do was ensure that the decision made makers were able to focus um, on the, the best quality evidence that was available at the time. So I was one of a newly formed team made up of information specialists and also public health specialists. And we were tasked to develop a COVID-19 digest as a way of rapidly sharing um, the new evidence. So each week we would look to identify a small selection of papers containing new findings, e insights or emerging trends. Um, and that meant in practice screening at the height around 2000 papers each week um, with only 40 to 60 of those papers actually being included in the digest. And to put this into context, over the course of the two years of the pandemic, when the digest was running, we screened over, um, sorry, almost 10,000 research papers, um, but only around 4% of all the records were included in the digest. And of course, the results that we found were only a small percentage of all the results, all the evidence that was coming out during the pandemic. So as I say, our focus was to highlight a small selection of relevant novel papers each week. And these were categorized by themes, including diagnostics, infection control, and later vaccines, um, and summarized in three to five bullet points. The whole idea being to better inform um, decision makers. They didn't need to con to focus on all the volume of information coming out, they really needed the key data to inform their decision making. Alongside services like the um, Digest that were designed to push out information, other colleagues were working on synthesizing the evidence that was emerging. And again, there were challenges. There wasn't time to undertake um, a full systematic review. And so instead, methodology was developed, rapid reviews that streamlined the process whilst keeping the robust results. That meant that 
um, within my own organization, a rapid, rapid evidence team was set up. And that was an information scientist working alongside expert reviewers. And they devised a process so that the systematic searching was streamlined. And it meant that they were able to um, include a systematic search, screening, data extraction, critical appraisal, and then synthesis of the relevant information within a three to eight week period. And so in, in, incredible results from colleagues within my organization and, and elsewhere in terms of synth synthesizing the available evidence and also um, identifying where there were gaps in the evidence, um, which was often equally as important. And so um, they produced over 50 unique COVID-19 outputs um, across key policy areas that included airborne transmission, face coverings and vaccine effectiveness. There was also international um, collaboration that was taking place. As always, librarians have strong networks and we look, work to share information and collaborate. And so WHO, the World Health Organization, they initiated the Evidence COVID-19 Collaborative that um, enabled research organizations around the world to come together and collaborate, to share expertise, to produce rapid reviews and to reduce duplication of effort whilst maintaining quality standards. And all this, the work that was done within my organization, as I say, it was to enable the decision makers to focus on the key points um, and, to, and to inform new policy. Um, so as librarians, again, we know our communities, we know um, how best to present information to them and to ensure that it meets their needs. And so our um, digests were summarized and the priority was the internal um, focus within our organization. However, the digest grew, it was an, um, initially an internal product, but very quickly there was demand for it to be shared more widely. And by the end, we had more than 900 subscribers that was um, it, individuals, but also organizations. Um, and they were from um, researchers, they were government and non-government bodies, national and international um, re, um, think tanks, um, as well as practitioners. Um, and a subsequent survey after the digest was completed of 100 recipients demonstrated that the key outcome for their organizations was the support that this work contributed to their evidence-based policy making. So in terms of this, the contrib contribution that librarians made during the pandemic, well, of course, the first was identifying the evidence. And I think as public health specialists, we had the advantage of being more familiar, if you like, with searching unconventional sources for information, for looking outside of the core health um, and medical journals, um, for delving into the grey literature. But of course, there was still an enormous amount of learning that we had to undertake in order to adapt to the particular conditions um, that emerged during the pandemic and the way that the evidence base um, rapidly changed over time. Um, so one thing, for example, was in terms of the preprints, initially preprints would appear and then within a six month period, the article may uh, would be published within the journal. That changed over time and speeded up so that by the end preprints might be emerging and then within a week to two weeks, the article itself was being published. And so we wanted to ensure to capture this for our audience. Do, do, do wrap up in a minute or so if you can. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, evaluating and summarizing, yeah, we um, obviously librarians have got key skills both in evaluating the evidence and then summarizing and making this available. And then, communicating in an accessible format in order to inform policy. That's, that's it for me, um, Stephen. I just wanted to finish by saying that 
yeah, I think that librarians brought a strong skill set in response to a complex and rapidly developing um, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I appreciate and that I, I, I can only imagine quite how hectic it was. I remember sort of seeing emails very late at nights and very early in the mornings from, from all of our health librarian members during the pandemic because of just how hectic it was. I think it also underlines every time we heard a sort of a statement made by government about a policy on masks or whatever, just quite how much work and quite how complex the work was going into that statement. Mm -hmm. is and so it's a really helpful reminder that these are not just statements that come from one study or what someone thinks one morning it, it, it's a lot of work that goes into it and it really needs information professionals to get to that point so thank you okay thank you. with that I'm now going to go to Magda from Silesian Libraries but joining us currently from Geneva or just outside <laughs> yes that's right and <laughs> uh, thank you Stephen for having uh, introduced me uh, good morning everyone uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, it is great that so many of you were able to join us today. Uh, today I will be talking about the experience of Polish libraries uh, with uh, Ukrainian uh, citizens. And so uh, time is precious. So with that in mind, I will make my talk brief and I will start my presentation from the numbers. So I will share my screen. Just a that's working. Confirm when it's up there. Yep, that's working. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Just let me see. Yeah. That's right. So, and um, according to the UN, uh, when the war began. 10.4 million Ukrainian uh, citizens fled across the border to Poland. Uh, roughly uh, 2 million uh, are still there. Uh, it means uh, one in 17 people living in Poland is a Ukrainian refugee. Uh, based on survey data um, on refugee applying for a person number in Poland, uh, the biggest group uh, comprises women with a child or two children uh, below 18 years old. Uh, moreover, they are educated specialists, executives and blue collar workers. Uh, research show, uh, shows that um, refugees came uh, generally to the big cities and stayed uh, in uh, Ukrainian friends' houses. Um, this, of course, doesn't translate into simply maps to show uh, a real refugee who burst, but at least uh, can give us an idea of the scale of the phenomenon. Uh, on February 24, um, we didn't know what to do, and uh, there wasn't also the time for thinking. But Poland uh, opened its arms without hesitation and gave Ukrainians uh, the right to work, uh, to attend to schools and to receive social benefits. Um, now I would like to give microphone to uh, librarians from the public library in Hrubieshov, the closest city uh, near to Ukraine. Uh, these two brave ladies worked both as a librarian and after the work as a volunteer. Um, and this uh, part of the video is in Polish, but I prepared uh, English subtitles, so I hope that you will have opportunity to listen to uh, about their experience. Yeah. Jako biblioteka robimy dużo rzeczy. Rozmawiamy z mieszkańcami, bo bardzo potrzebują tych rozmów. Zwłaszcza osoby starsze są bardzo niespokojne, bardzo przeżywają. Poza tym też przychodzą do nas dzieci także z Ukrainy. Mamy tutaj kolorowanki, mamy książeczki. Kontakt z ich literaturą, z literaturą ukraińską. 
daje takie poczucie, że są bardziej u siebie. Bo spośród mnóstwa różnych rzeczy, jakie te dzieci dostają, no jednak tego tekstu ukraińskiego nie ma za bardzo, prawda? To są słodycze, to są zabawki, maskotki. Natomiast tu jest książka, to jest coś ponad, prawda? To wszystko zachodzi na siebie, bo jesteśmy wolontariuszami. Tutaj w pracy też gdzieś, gdzieś ktoś dzwoni, wychodzimy po pracy, idziemy na wolontariat na, na Hosir. No, no chyba każdy z nas, czy jedziemy na Alhes, czy w inne miejsce, czy na Zosin, jeżeli coś trzeba, bo jesteśmy i bibliotekarzami, i wolontariuszami. Jako bibliotekarz. Oh, yes. That's okay. So I need only to turn on my camera to show you. Okay, so uh, as you can, uh, as you saw, that um, books were very important in this part, uh, in this time. And reading books in your language, as well as well known stories, uh, helped you, can help you uh, adapt to new situation. And uh, librarians also notice it. And I would like to mention about uh, two big campaigns. It was organized uh, in Poland last year by a uh, book institute. And it was a give uh, a book to Ukrainian child as well as booking for the start. Um, the book institute contacted with Ukrainian publishing houses and and bought 85,000 uh, books to uh, for or more than 450 public libraries in Poland. And it helped Ukrainian children and teenagers uh, to have good memories in this time. But um, lending books and reading books, uh, it's not only what libraries uh, uh, do this time. So let's see what they do, did more. Uh, first of all, at the beginning of the war, libraries were a kind of information desk uh, and they provide information uh, about accommodation, uh, about uh, schools, about uh, medical uh, help, hospitals and health clinic. Uh, Ukrainians uh, could come to public libraries and uh, use uh, internet for free. They also have keyboards, as you can see, with Ukrainian alphabets. And many librarians help them to fill in official document, documents, which allowed them to stay in Poland and receive, uh, receive financial support. I would like to direct your attention to the fact that this time, many libraries collected necessities. Uh, people uh, felt that they wanted to help to help people to Ukrainians, and they took some uh, some long term food, to warm clothes, cosmetics, and brought uh, brought to the public libraries. And uh, librarians collected all the things and transported them to the shelters and also to refugee centers. And uh, so it wasn't official. Uh, action, but uh, it was um, connected with them with this moment. And uh, what was noticed at the beginning is that the worst uh, thing for refugee is isolation. And so many, the, ma the great majority of public libraries, they organize uh, language courses uh, which allowed Ukrainians to learn basic the basic of Polish. Uh, it was free classes and it was quite popular and also it was very important to find a new job. As we said at the beginning, many well-educated Ukrainian women came, so it was also important for them, but not only that. Um, participants of these courses noticed that um, uh, learning Polish made it possible to meet other Ukrainians and to just talk with them and have a cup of tea. Uh, during these classes, librarians had a special task. Uh, they organized uh, some activities for the children. And uh, together with librarians, 
uh, children were drawing, playing, uh, playing games, and also spent time together. Uh, and also they attended in many library activities as well, night in the library, uh, booking clubs, and meet also uh, Polish children there. Uh, what's more, when, um, when, uh, when I talked with my colleagues from public libraries, they, they uh, told me that uh, children from Ukraine uh, they felt very comfortable in public libraries uh, because uh, they came there after the lesson and spent time together. They developed their, their new hobbies and uh, read uh, books and uh, spent time on the computers. Uh, and uh, also it, it was because librarians had more time for them than the teachers at schools. And uh, they felt that they don't have so many roles in the library as in the school. And it was very interesting results of this, of this uh, activity that children uh, told their uh, parents about uh, public libraries and they came together uh, to the library. So it was a very good uh, possibility uh, to integration. And uh, I would like to highlight that very important role for integration uh, was in the public libraries and they organized together uh, many events such as concerts, uh, festivals, uh, that it was the place where they, uh, can, they could find out more about Polish and Ukrainian cultures. And what is important here that uh, Ukrainian citizens, uh, citizens which um, uh, came had came here co had come here before the war uh, helped uh, refugees a lot and helped to connect them with Polish society. Uh, so uh, it uh, uh, it was really great to to notice it. And so summarizing my presentation, I would like to highlight that uh, Polish library reacted incredibly and they uh, they were really good partners for the uh, local societies. So I would be happy to answer any questions you have made. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you, Jack, no, especially those are practical examples of showing what, what was going on and the sort of amazing flexibility, responsiveness of, of libraries in terms of working out not only how to provide information in an effective way, but also I think bringing some of those themes that Sigrun brought up earlier about all the different things you can do around information, how much the library space and the library resources, from Geneva to the border with Ukraine in Poland, they can actually come together in order to provide a, a more meaningful experience. And I think it, it's also such a, a powerful, example of, of where you don't necessarily have access to information you arrive in a country you don't speak the language you don't have other resources and so just showing what the difference that can be made by doing that of course also i bring up those themes of reactivity the ability to mobilize quickly that emma also talked about in, in the case of what happened within within the english context so thank you so much so we're going to stay in 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 the public library context with uh Greta Cavella Tiene, um, who will tell me how to pronounce E with a dot over it in, in Lithuanian, because I'm getting it wrong, I'm sure. I can do Polish, but not, not, not Lithuanian. No, it's quite okay. I'm Cavella Tiene, and that's, that's really okay. So hello, well, to yeah, <laughs> hello to everyone. I will share my screen. So if, uh, uh, can Stefan confirm that? If, uh, I, I can confirm. Yeah. Okay, good. amazing. So um, the main thing that I would love to share uh, with you uh, that we are trying to uh, do some activities in Lithuanian public libraries. It's a media information literacy activities um, as known as building skills for information use. So. Um, media and information literacy uh, mostly is the ability 
to identify, obtain, evaluate, select, and use ethically and responsibly relevant information from variety. I mean, the variety of information sources. To understand the role um, and function of media in democracy society, understand the conditions under which media can perform their functions, uh, critically evaluate media content, we have the skills to produce content. So active and inactive actions that we do use every day when we access information and creating content. So um, Lithuanian public libraries have taken the leadership in this area. And uh, as you can see, we have a large network of libraries in Lithuania as a small country. Um, with just around 3 million people. So we have a lot of big and small libraries in everywhere, in every urban area. Um, every small village branches are familiar with media and information literacy. So uh, we started in 2022 and we started to, to creating a, a logo that we are um, trying to implement it in every activity that uh, libraries do. So we started to celebrating a, a media and, and information literacy week that is in last week of October. And we chose the target audience that it's um, adults working very always in a hurry with no time influencing their children and their parents living in social bubbles um, always always trying to achieve every goal in the world so those people um, we thought that we need to reach them as hard as possible um, so um, we tried to create a lot of events and most of them were online events. We didn't ask them to come to the library. Library came where they were. So a lot of podcasts, a lot of good discussions, a lot of events for them online to listen, whatever they are. So uh, we did... Uh, um, uh, 11 events uh, in that week um, that got around 5,000 views, uh, two brainstorming games, one reading promotion program, a communication campaign, and during this communication campaign we reach around a million people. So um, as I mentioned before, a country with 3 million people to reach uh, 1 million people and tell them that information and media literacy events are happening in public libraries is quite um, a, a good achievement for us. So the radio campaigns, the Facebook campaigns, and a lot of a lot of things that were happening in October last year. So we created a Facebook page um, and dedicated not just for the um, week events, but just for everything that is about media information literacy. Uh, the website with all the necessary information for the librarians and for the other users and planning to do the Instagram page this year. So uh, we also um, uh, created and translated the board game. Uh, it called Populistas um, and it was launched uh, by the end of the 2022. And it's a critical thinking game that develops media and information literacy, awareness and resistance of information manipulation and um, uh, additional um, edition uh, of the game will launch in 2023. Um, we also created a training program. Um, you can see uh, the uh, tasks and the topics that it covers. So it's all about um, information and how to use it, how to evaluate, how to try to be safe uh, on the internet, uh, how to try to develop the critical thinking skills, 
because uh, we have all the access of all the information in the world and we need to try to develop those skills for our users. So um, the training program, uh, it's uh, three and a half hundred pages. You heard me right, three and a half hundred pages of PDF file and plus the uh, PowerPoint uh, video and pictures and everything that you can wish for. So this program is for the librarians to learn everything they have to learn and teach the communities. So this year we're trying to um, launch this uh, program and every librarian in Lithuanian public libraries will be familiar with this and will try to share this information with the users in every possible um, content that you can imagine. Educational programs, information um, pro programs that they are already having in the libraries, the events, the exhibits, the everything that we have in, in, in our sector, um, in every part of it, we can include media and information literacy. So um, we have a lot of examples about COVID, about vaccinations, about war in Ukraine, and what, in, what information about those topics are really sensitive and we need to, to, to get the right access. So it's also adapted for people who cannot read like regular text and um, the methodology itself, which is a PDF file, is fully adapted for people using voice synthesis soft software uh, for blind, partially uh, sighted or with the just reading disabilities. Uh, so the caption layers um, organized as properly presented, making it easier to navigate through the content. Illustrations um, uh, that we have in this program, uh, the um, information about the ev every picture in the, in that in that program is in the alt text. So uh, when you use it normally, you you are not reading it, but when people are using um, the those programs, um, the, the program um, will read the, what it's in the picture. And you're, I'm showing the one example that in, on the internet, nobody knows, knows you're a dog. So um, you just need to explain what the picture says. So it's suitable for wide, wide audience. Um, so the font and, and everything is, is, um, is just available for everyone. So um, all county libraries have their own responsibilities. Uh, for example, the county library of Shule was responsible for training program. And uh, my library in Panevejis is organizing Mill Week. So Klepa, the county library is responsible for communication campaign. And we just have uh, our own tasks to do this huge media and information literacy program that it's um, from our government to try to implement. So um, this is uh, the example of uh, communication campaign. Um, we have a lot of videos, uh, just a, a, a quick and long uh, interviews with a famous actor who is asking different questions and, and uh, talking to different people about media, um, common creative commons and, and all, the, all the fake news and the safety on the internet. So thank you very much for listening to me today. So um, I just want to make sure that uh, you heard me that um, in Lithuanian libraries, we are uh, taking the leading role to um, connect everyone um, who is working with media and information literacy to just work together and use public libraries to just reach our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greta. That was excellent. And, and I think I don't know. I, I, I hope I hope that everyone sort of today clearly understands this: the importance of media and information literacy. And clearly, it's something that we, we talk a lot about. But obviously, I don't know, it's easy to talk. It's great to actually see practical examples of what can be done on the ground. I, 
I like that final point that you made in particular about the potential role of libraries, not just as being partners, but as being federators, as being places, organizations that can actually bring different players together, focus on information given their place within communities, given their sort of broader legitimacy. So that that that's a really power that that felt like a really powerful point. I liked also that emphasis on um what it is that you know, simply having access to information probably isn't enough. And we've heard from different places. So Magda talking about you know, the, the outreach and bring people in and giving them support. Sigrun talking about making use of the space, trying to, I don't know, focusing in particular on, on, on building that trust. And I think that trust goes hand in hand with media and information literacy that you talked about. It's difficult to trust if you don't feel informed, if you don't feel like you have the ability to trust and make your own mind up. So excellent. So that that's the first part of, of the conversation. What I wanted to do now is, is move into a slightly more sort of open discussion and, and, and hopefully bring out some of the themes because I'm conscious that anyone looking at the description of the session will probably have thought that well these are slightly diverse themes that we've talked about health information, we've talked about response to refugee crises, we've talked about informing, creating knowledge within the international system, and we've just talked now about media and information literacy. But I think I know the reason for doing it is that there is this common thread in there that it's all about what is necessary to make sure that everyone does have access to information to support their own development. So um, the first question I, I had down on my list, um, and I'm going to start uh, by asking Sigrun to just give just a couple of sentences on this one, is to give your sense of it, how well the need to create, organise, safeguard and enable meaningful access to evidence is recognised in your context. Yes, thank you, Stephen. I'm going to try and be more concise this time. Obviously, it's very recognized in the United Nations context, right? Because uh, because this is kind of the the we, we're dealing with the big programs and uh, and all the actors that are set up. I mean, we purposefully put as a library into the United Nations system to help with that, to help with uh, creating, organizing, safeguarding, enabling uh, access and making it more meaningful. Um, I think it's you know, we, what we're trying to do, for example, is we have a research guide with, that we pull together. I mean, I think many libraries do have that. And what we try to do is really bring out the UN knowledge, internal produced knowledge, so the documents, the publications uh, that um, that bring together this evidence for particularly for the agendas and put that then together with the external materials. You know, like, for example, what I was saying, a really important community, the NGOs and non-governmental organizations because they very often are very complementary to what the United Nations is producing, but also to individuals. And so uh, this is, uh, it's something that we actively work on. Thanks. Excellent. It's good to know that you're sharing this recognition that I know the fact the UN is investing in having a sort of a good effective library, but then sharing that out is super useful. And, hope, and that leads to others seeing the value in this, which is powerful. Um, Emma, what about you? How well do you think that, that this importance of meaningful access to information is recognised within within the context you're aware of? Um, I'd say certainly from um, a public health sector background, so as a public health librarian wearing my previous hat, there was a strong awareness of the need for um, information, for evidence to inform um, practice, to inform decision making. Um, and I think um, relating that to the pandemic, I think that put us in a strong position to um, have the expertise to facilitate sharing that, to facilitate knowledge and mobilization. And it was important that, that wasn't just within our organization, but that was more widely shared. And of course we benefited from other organizations doing the same. So I think the, the point that Sigra made earlier about networks and being trusted people players within the networks exactly the same in the public health sector um, there was also work done for example by the librarian reserve corps an organization that was set up by the world health organization where they responded to the call from the global outbreak alert and response network and they've been um, working to share learning in terms of bringing out a set of guidelines for searching during um, a human uh, human, uh, sorry, humanitarian um, 
or public health emergency. So um, I think it's recognising the importance and also sharing good practice around this. Excellent. No, I think I've, I've, that, and you've just shared that some times. It, it's, it, it, it's a really good point. Also, just I don't know, obviously recognising the importance of things is good, but making it easy is also good <laughs> to actually to actually access this and spread those good examples. Um, Magda, what about you in the in the Polish context? How well do you think that there is recognition of this importance of meaningful access to information? Well. Uh... Considering my topic of my presentation, it was very important, especially at the beginning, because um, we um, we met a lot of uh, Ukrainian refugees. We didn't know exactly the number, how it looked in reality. So when uh, we got some statistics and uh, we would know how many people we live in the cities, and um, also uh, what city libraries, public libraries we would have. Uh, maybe the public libraries cooperated with, uh, with the um, local government, and they also provided some place to, to sleep and also to check information. So cooperation with the local governments were very uh, important. Uh, as well as, um, as I said at, at during my presentation, this campaign about the books, and it was organized in, uh, uh, with uh, information about uh, children who attended uh, to the schools. So books uh, came exactly to the towns where the number of the children were the higher. Uh, so it was uh, really well organized and uh, we could point exactly which libraries had how many books were, they will really got. Uh, so I also remember that uh, that information about accommodation it was also provided. Uh, and we could uh, we could uh, prepare for that. Thank you. And uh, it's, this is always a really powerful point that also clearly for libraries to be able to do their job, they also require information. So this awareness, this readiness that we want to be able to see in individuals, we want to be able to see in governments, clearly it's also there in libraries in terms of their own planning. Thank you, Greta. What, what, what about you? How do you see the, 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 the role of creation, organisation, safeguarding and access to evidence is being valued in Lithuania? Um, the, the development of these competencies that we need to have uh, when we access th that much of information in our days, um, these competencies and skills um, are, I'm happy to say that it's included uh, in the strategic plans of most the most important institutions in Lithuania, so ministries of education, national defense, internal affairs, culture, foreign affairs. And for example, we have funding from uh, national defense uh, programs that it's uh, cybersecurity programs that we are developing. So it's part of this, part of that importance of, of Lithuania um, to have skills and to share those skills with people that need to know how to recognize the false information in the internet. So uh, a working group that I call them the work task of, <laughs> so that group of people are set by the Ministry of Culture um, in, in Lithuania, uh, has drafted an action plan uh, for the libraries to carry out a range of activities to help develop the, those media and information literacy skills for people. So from that um, uh, group that are actually um, know what, what they're doing in, in all the public library sector. So they are asked us to build a program, to build a celebration week that we can celebrate the information access and all those activities. And they are uh, just uh, helping us to, to develop, a, develop more of, of, of those in all the strategic documents that we are included. Excellent. That, thank you. That, I know, that, that's I admit, and I work for a library organization. That's the first time I've heard of library activities being supported by a defense ministry, which is that that's that's 
it, it's fascinating, but it's, I also personally I find that quite encouraging that obviously instead of spending money on, on guns and bombs, there's actually an effort to build up skills because in the end, the best defense against misinformation, whether it, it's sort of weaponized deliberate disinformation or misinformation, in the end, it's by building up skills at the level of individuals. That's the only way that we're going to permanently overcome this. And it's a lot less clumsy than, than regulation often is. So excellent. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. I'd say if any of our um, other participants want to raise questions, do use the questions and answers. Otherwise, we'll run through to the half hour. So I think, as, as said when introducing this segment, um, we're obviously talking about quite a a diverse set of types of institution in, in, in very different parts of Europe and working with very different um, partners. However, clearly the issues are the same, the importance of, of activating information, the importance of delivering skills, possibilities, um, of responding to actual need. Um, can you see benefits and what benefits could you see coming from a more systemic approach to from a systematic approach to promoting meaningful access to information. And let's start with Sigrun. Yeah, thanks, um, Stephen. So systematic approach. Uh, I was thinking immediately about uh, what's happening right now in the economic commissions, not so much here in Europe, but in the other economic commissions. For example, there's the economic, commission, economic and social commission for Western Asia, ESQA, which is part of the, the UN secretariat system as well. And what they did is they pulled together, um, they created a knowledge hub. So there's a real drive right now actually for a really systematic approach to gather knowledge uh, from the United Nations and from its partners about the SDGs, about implementation and so on. And it's uh, it's done before formal, but also for informal information. I found that very interesting. It's really just come to be now. So it's quite new. Uh, if you go onto the, their website, they immediately go into this. You have this, uh, it's like a search engine, I guess it's called a portal called Manara. And then you go in there and you have a data portal. You have different ones, which are mainly Arabic standing, so I can't exactly explain what it is, but there's also the Arab SDG gateway. So what they're doing is they're pulling information together on a regional level. And then when you open that up, you have, I think it's at least 30 different types of organizations that work together. They usually don't work together. You know, you would assume that UN system and HSEs and funds, you know, there's a lot of collaboration. No, you always have to really go out of your way to collaborate with the others. And here they are all together. You have UNICEF, you have UN Women, you have UNAIDS. International Organization for Migration, uh, you know, food program, everything is is pulled together for the SDGs on the Arab SDG gateway. So uh, I think this is, uh, you know, it's very obvious what the benefits are from that. And then you do have the library though, which is at the at the center, which used to be a very very small library. I mean, still like uh, they're in Lebanon, you know. And last time I was there was in 2018. They only have like 10 staff, and they pull together this knowledge hub. And that means they use all these networks, the things that we've already said before, and, and brought it together. And then also, though, uh, the technology, uh, because I think, you know, this is really at the, the essence of that is how to use this technology, the search to create the portals, you know, to make the search effective and meaningful. And then they pulled in, for example, also information from the social media for that. So you can search across all this and and have your, your really current information on the SDGs right there. So I think that's a... That's a really good example for a systematic approach that seems to work. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Absolutely. It's an incredibly impressive thing to do for a team of just 10 people as, as, as well. And I know it's Lebanon, you can't even necessarily count on the electricity. So it makes it particularly impressive to be able to have done that. So that, 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 I mean, that, that yeah, that, that, that's fantastic. And also, again, I suppose that point you made about about I don't know, about partnerships and bringing in different people who might not otherwise be there is a really powerful one and, and that's hopefully what libraries can do and just really advance our work. Um, Emma, what about you? What, what benefits can you see from taking a more systemat systematic approach to promoting meaningful access? Um, well, first of all, from the context of our organisation, um, taking what was a systematic approach was essential because because of the complexity of the situation, you know, the fast changing evidence base. Um, but of course, having set up something that would follow um, robust processes, we wanted to ensure that it was made more widely available. Um, and as I mentioned in my presentation, 
our organisation was represented in the, the World Health Organisation's network. That was the, the world, the, sorry, the WHO COVID Evidence Collaborative that were working together to share expertise, produce rapid reviews and reduce um, re research duplication. Um, and so I think that's a good example of what can be achieved by working to collectively um, and it ties in with some of the challenges during the pandemic in terms of the lack of equity of access to information and also being represented and having your your reality shared and so that I think there's more that can be done to have this global network um, and to work together to um, because obviously during the pandemic we started from the a very similar kind of baseline and um, many countries who had experience to share we all need to have that opportunity to contribute and develop the evidence base. Thank you. No, I, I realise of course the fact that there's a knowledge and evidence hub already from 2018 so pre-pandemic that, that's yes. a type of collective approach but I think that, that point in particular about it's only if we act systemically that we're able to look for the gaps and we're able to look for who, who isn't included that that's that's a, that, that's a really good point it's a really powerful point to make um magda ah uh, yes uh, so about this systematic approach um when we are talking about the libraries and refugees uh, i think and I, I saw that we uh, um, made this uh, approach a little bit elastic uh and uh, and test it during the reality and the example is, uh, for instance, education. Uh, so number four, SDG and partnership as well. So a uh, good example was that um, that uh, the schools um, got a possibility that Ukrainian children could uh, attend uh, the classes, uh, but libraries cooperate with schools and after the classes, they came to the libraries as well. And what's more is a special project now, uh, which helped um, children to attend uh, the schools to the Ukrainian school uh, from the public libraries. So they can come and connect uh, via internet, via computers uh, with their children. And also uh, they prepare some uh, their database with all the materials uh, which they can use and have uh, have contact with uh, with uh, Ukrainian teachers as well, uh, because also Polish schools um, uh, gave a possibility that Ukrainian teachers could uh, teach uh, in in Polish schools in their children. So uh, that's that's the example of education for young people, but it's also for another education, as I said, about learning um, Polish. So uh, for adults, for lifelong learning, uh, many people could come and uh, and uh, develop their skills, uh, but uh, we couldn't do that without any partnership, without cooperation with many local institutions and uh, non-profit organizations as well. So uh, that's a really new situation for my nation. And uh, I see that public libraries really have a crucial role there. Thank you. No, I think, again, uh, it, it's really helpful, again, to underline that point of partnerships and how actually in, by taking that systemic approach and you see the role of libraries in there, but libraries also make new contacts and, and can then start working more effectively and, and on a sustainable basis with others to deliver. Uh, I, I'll come back to SDG numbers. It was good you mentioned four and 17 already. Is that, I, I'll, I'll cover that a bit in my summing up at the end. Um, Greta, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> yes, so as I mentioned before, uh, the systemic approach um, is able to provide a funding. So it's very nice to not compete for the money with the others, you know, when we have those kind of uh, systems in, in, in every part um, of projects. So yeah, we just have funding and we need to, uh, it's not a lot, believe me, but um, we just need to use them for, for, for our activities. So that's uh, quite good that it's just for this actual um, 
skill developing and and all this program it's also uh, good that we have for example a group of people that are res representatives of all the associations in the library sector uh, so we have a group that um, is responsible for this program we have representatives from national library public library association county library association academic libraries association then libraries in the schools and every single sector where the libraries are so in lithuania we have representatives from their association in this group so every uh, different libraries that that we have in lithuania everyone's looking forward to do this program so that's quite amazing that we are just connecting connecting also those uh, partners that is universities and geos and, and and other other stuff but also the connection of the same sector that's is systemic so it's 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 amazing to to have some partners and to feel like you have friends not just in your library sector that's that, that's great and i think and it, it's a point that we come across quite a lot that obviously there are different often there are many different parts of government that benefits from benefit from the work of the work of, of libraries working as information sectors as centers for empowerment and connectivity but they rarely pay for them <laughs> and so actually having this sort of centralized program that brings in the different ministries of defense of, of, of culture etc to pay for this but i like also the this emphasis on bringing together the different types of library because in the end, if you want to cover people throughout life, you need to cover school libraries, academic libraries, national libraries, public libraries, in order to do that. And we don't see a huge amount of that. So this is this is really pioneering. This is really exciting. Um, so we've got five minutes left. So I think what I will do, we've got one more question, which is what recommendations you would make and, and to sort of take forwards and that certainly we as IFLA can look to bring both to the, the, the forum taking place, the, the plenary days of the forum taking place tomorrow and, and Thursday, but also to the UN in, in New York in July. Um, let's, I don't know, 30 to 40 seconds each, and then I will wrap up. So Sigrun, what recommendations would you make? So my recommendation obviously comes from the success of these knowledge hubs. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, to say you know that this is a systematic approach that benefits from networks so to be more systematic and to be stronger overall we need to tap into this knowledge that's available in the different networks and and find a solution to tie the people's work together in all its diversity thanks that was short that was good excellent <laughs> very disciplined <laughs> fantastic thank you um and over to emma Thank you. Well, my point is also about networks and joining networks, but in this case, it's about librarians joining the multidisciplinary networks that have formed to reflect on what happened during the um, the pandemic and, and to build back stronger. Um, and so recognising that it highlighted some of the challenges, the weaknesses within the evidence system and ensuring that librarians are taking part in these conversations about how we can um, make changes, picking up on the recon recommendations, the call for action from organisations like the Evidence Commission, the World Health Organisation, and also from Cochrane Convenes, uh, recognising that librarians have a part to play in a contrib contribution to those conversations. Excellent thing, yeah. making librarians uh, part of no. the conversations, not just between themselves, but yes, with, with other disciplines as well. Excellent. Um, Magda, over to you. Uh, so my recommendation will be very quickly. Uh, I really recommend to stay uh, working together and to be more elastic uh, to all the programs because uh, we are in the middle of uh, research and to work for SDG. SDGs and uh, many new things appeared. So uh, as a COVID and also as so the war in the Europe. Uh, so we would like to try to keep going and working with uh, with uh, other institutions and public libraries as well because they are really good uh, partners in it. Excellent. Thank you. Is this lots of SDG seventeen in there? <laughs> we'll summarize that in the end as well. So um, and then Greta, over to you. So uh, I would uh, have some wish for all of us uh, to keep going, 
because we are um, doing work that it's really hard to see the difference quickly and to count the, you know, the butterflies in the spring. So um, I just wish that we keep going and we, in the long way, we will see the results that it's, I think it, it's just a huge impact that we're doing it. Thank you so, so, so much. And, and, and you know, I think so certainly echo the point about keeping going, but I, I think that leads in nicely. So just, just to wrap up, the recommendations being made, I think it, it's fascinating to me how closely this actually fits in with a lot of the logic behind the 2030 agenda as a whole, that we need to look for cross-cutting solutions. We need to look to the longer term, so we can't expect to find short-term solutions. There's a real emphasis in the 2030 agenda on, on not leaving anyone behind, on thinking about, well, what is it that's actually needed to help everyone realize their rights, their rights to development? Um, there's a lot in there obviously about partnerships and a readiness to do things differently and to work with different groups and to realize the potential that we do have to work together at this much higher scale. And so there's a parallel movement, that I suspect, I, I feel coming from this, that within the library field in particular in response to crises, in particular in response to pressing needs, libraries are embracing these ideas, libraries are embracing these principles, but in doing so they also allow societies as a whole to embrace these principles and embrace these ways of working, these ways of thinking that really underline the, 20, the 2030 agenda as a whole. I, I know that a particular element of that of course is the fact that we're looking across policy areas and I think as I've repeated a couple of times that this is quite a diverse group, we're not all talking about exactly the same topic immediately but there are those common themes and so for example I know that we've, we've talked a lot about SDG 3 on health on 4 on education on 5 on, on inclusion and equality we've talked about giving people opportunities under 8 about connecting people about innovating under 9 about um, uh, avoiding inequalities integrating refugees under 10 about communities under 11 about access to information, about better governance under 16, and of course, partnerships under 17. So it's an extremely broad area, but there is this really strong common thread that if we do have library fields, libraries as a whole, that are embracing these principles under the SDGs, we can really make this really positive contribution to achieving the SDGs as a whole. So with that, I'd really like to thank Sigrun, uh, Emma, Magda, and Greta for your time. Thank you so much. We will put up the recording on the IFLA website and um, it should be maybe available from the, the UNECE website as well. Thank you to all of our panelists and I wish you a very good rest of the day and um, to those of you in Geneva or following the UN forum, a very good forum as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.